so we started to look at the industry. Uh, we saw a lot of problems in the industry, and a lot of a lot of negative headlines, frankly. And there's two big buckets we put those uh, those those barriers. In. One is accessibility. This stuff is still expensive. It's clunky. It's kind of in the butt to operate. Uh, the second one is uh, is understanding. A lot of people when they think about VR, they just think about gaming. That's easy to do. Oftentimes when I'm talking to people, hey, I work at a VR company, and they're like, oh, my grandkids would love it, is, is the typical response. And it's like, well, if there's more to it than that, do you have a half hour for me to talk to you about VR? Um, and then the last piece is content. So the other thing is if you think about, uh, think about this bad boy right here in your pocket, this is an extremely powerful tool, but without the Uber, the Twitter, email, without the content, the applications on it, it's just a hunk of metal. So it took years for people to understand how do I actually use this platform and use the best of this platform uh, so that it's attached to all of us. And, and really, as we fast forward to today, in 2019, uh, for better or for worse, this is fully integrated in my life. This has changed the way I socialize, I create, I work, I play. Um, and we're big believers that VR is the next competing platform after mobile will have the same impact on all of those facets uh, of our life. So fast forward to round five, we opened about a year ago, and we're really focused on attacking those three buckets. So one is accessibility. As you see, we have all the hardware set up. It's ready to rock and roll. Um, two is understanding. We spend a lot of time working with businesses, um, helping them understand uh, immersive technology, and that it's not just a trade show trinket. Uh, and then lastly, content, and so we're working on building uh, content to start to help fill that void of we have this amazing tech, now what are you actually going to do with it? So, uh, so with that, let's get rolling. We have an exceptional panel here today, and maybe we'll start by, if you want to introduce yourself, Ty, and take it down the line and get rolling. Sure. Uh, I'm Ty Burris. I'm co-owner and director of uh, WallRide, a virtual reality video game company in Minneapolis. Uh, we make weird video games for consoles. We also make uh, virtual reality experiences, um, mostly for events. So we'll work with uh, brands and uh, different licenses and uh, make really condensed, awesome, intuitive experiences that you can go to a trade show or an expo and really uh, interact with the brand um, in a short period of time. They're built for throughput and stuff. So um, I also created a job simulator and Rick and Morty VR um, at my old studio in Texas. So we played that here. Um, so we really helped to find a lot of standards and stuff in, in VR early on. Um, and now we're just uh, using everything we learned and making awesome little VR experiences. For the record, Ty is modest about it, but, but Job Simulator is one of the most popular VR experiences that exist in the world today. He was part of that team, which is pretty cool. I'm Steve Paul, and I'm the director of Learning and Technology at Middle St. Margaret's, which is a 712 uh, school over here in St. Louis Park. Um, and when the school hired me, they had a specific need to run the technology department because they were going to a one to one laptop program and things like that. But, but I, I took care of that and then I kind of made it through, I, I created the rest of the job myself. Basically, I, I look at it as I get to do all the fun stuff that principals never get a chance to do. So I'm always looking out at the future of education, the future of the world, the workplace, and what do we have to do with kids to help get them ready for that rapidly changing world. So, so I, VR kind of fits right into that to that model of, of what is the potential of this or any other technology to, to help kids learn and also to get them prepared for uh, uh, an entrepreneurial world. And I'm Michael Obata. I actually work at Target. Uh, part of my job as a consumer futurist, really thinking about where our, where consumers are headed. Um, and I got introduced to Aaron Travis uh, through a friend from college. Uh, put my, the, my first time thing that we are headset on and was like, holy crap, there's something really awesome here that's happening. And uh, we've been exploring together like how to use VR in sort of the learning and development space and the corporate environment and building empathy. One of the first applications they had me in, I could experience a meeting as a woman um, and what that felt like. And then there was another application where I could experience what it was like being in a wheelchair. Um, and it, they're just so, they're so powerful to, to feel and, and be in that space. So, yeah, so I'm going to be the panel moderator today uh, between these three geniuses. Um, and like we were said, if you have questions, we can kind of jump in. We're going to talk for about 25, 30 minutes, um, just so everyone kind of knows timing. And everyone knows where the rest, if you need to use the restroom, there's right around the corner here. So just 
feel free to get up and, and do that. But um, I would hope if you could jump up and grab some food. Yeah, grab yeah, food. If you need another beer or wine, uh, guys in the back can help out too. So um, we actually had a chance to chat last week, uh, and I was just blown away from the conversation we had. So we wanted to hopefully recreate that a little bit today. Um, one of the stories I've seen actually, you know, when we met for coffee, you were mentioning that. Uh, it's no longer the textbook and teacher who are the master of content in the classroom anymore. A teacher's job is really shifting to curating a learning environment that adapts to the individual in ways that kids learn. Can you tell the, the audience here a little bit more about what that shift sort of has looked like at your school and how we are to play in that way? Um, <clears throat> the, if you go back to your own childhood and you asked a question in class that the teacher didn't know the answer to, what was the typical response? It was. I don't know, but maybe I'll get back to you and you just need to get back to you, right? Or, yeah. or, 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 or you, know, you know, go to the library and look it up or, or whatever. And now with, with you know, the phone in every pocket, the laptop in front of everybody's face, um, content's not the issue anymore. Content is ubiquitous. And, and, and what teachers have had to really get a hold of is I, 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 can't, I can't hide behind trying to pretend like I'm the expert anymore. Um, and so, and so they they have they really have to go from being the sage on the stage to being the guy on the side and, and help you know and now it's now it's the opposite it's they're drinking the kids are drinking from a fire hose the information's out there so much that they have to the teachers are now like picking and choosing which pieces of which pieces of that of that flow they should expose their students to to give them the best experience and so um, and, you know and it, and it it gets down to this, one of, one of the two features that I think are most important is, is creating a personalized experience for students. Um, the, the, the potential of any of these technologies is that kids can enter into an experience, go at different paces, um, accelerate or slow down um, to the extent that they're able to, and then, and then also have a lot of ownership, like make some choices. So I'm in a, I'm in a virtual world, and I, and I, I know there's I'm going to explore this entire virtual world. I get to choose how I how I approach it, what I engage in, and, and how I move on to something else. And it's um, teachers are doing that with phones, they're doing that with laptops. They're starting to do it with virtual reality. And you can imagine, you know, some people resist change, and there are still very traditional teachers out there that, that don't embrace this. But but we're uh, aspiring to win. What what type of applications uh, are the kids using when they're entering the What are they Yeah, sure. I mean, we're it, it, it's still early, right? We're still top of the first inning in the industry, and uh, VR experiences uh, are just one piece of the puzzle. And so it's not a hey, go do this VR experience, and you're just automatically going to have all learning objectives pulled out. So we're spending a lot of time working with teachers uh, to develop that curriculum around the experience. No different than taking a field trip to the museum. Well, that's great and all, but let's let's talk about it. Let's have a, let's have a deeper discussion so um, we can really extract the learning objectives. So some of the things we've done, and, and the other piece is we're trying to, the best we can, uh, prepare kids for the real world and use VR, how it's being used in the real world. So one uh, class we've done uh, with Nil has been an industrial design. So if, uh, if you look at big companies out there like a Ford, for example, they're using VR to do most of their initial prototyping and design of their products. And so we have that same software here at Renault 5. And so they, and they are pretty progressive in terms of industrial design at their school. So it just seamlessly fit, the VR prototyping piece seamlessly fit into their existing curriculum. Uh, and before you know it, we're, we're teaching high schoolers how to do graphic prototyping in VR from uh, putting on a headset to being in a blank room to having a tangible 3D printed product in your hand, uh, which is pretty profound and amazing. Um, but then on the other side of the spectrum, um, we're having teachers approach us and we're using VR for the use cases we never would have imagined. I think we love telling the story the first class that we actually worked with Steve on was a sports journalism class. And so we're big believers that VR is going to have a profound impact on the way athletes train for sports and also the way that you uh, digest sports or consume sports. So think about the NBA, you're sitting courtside, 
Well, you can only sell 50 seats physically, but with VR, you can sell unlimited seats, theoretically. Right? So uh, they had a sports journalism class come in, and uh, they got to go through sports training applications and sit courtside at NBA game, and their objective was to go back and write a paper on how VR is going to impact uh, sports in the future. So that was uh, a project that wasn't even on our radar, uh, but again, it just came out of a collaboration with the uh, rest of the teacher. You can also sit by whoever you want. <laughs> yeah, and you've also you had geometry classes come in and use it. Uh, yeah, art, 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 art. I mean, I was surprised to me how, how, how powerful art is. And after now thinking about it, it's not as fun. But um, it even inspired our art teacher to offer a new class this year, which is called product design. Um, you know, it's a marriage between art and engineering. Um, and, uh, and so she, I think she's going to schedule to come over here multiple times so that the kids get proficient enough at the technology that they start to really dive deeper into the, into the potential. Two things there. One, there's a beer can up there called Haptic. I don't know if you guys saw it. That's the world's first beer can design in VR that we just launched uh, last Friday. Unfortunately, we, we sold out of it on Friday night. Um, <laughs> And then maybe it'd be super interesting. So Ty, from the development side, what we love is that like the, the whole art and development side with VR, we're now at the intersection of that. So when you're building out a team and you're working on a project like Job Simulator, there's a lot of artists on that team. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, the pipeline is changing so much too. Like how we can go, you know, you're not just building something for VR. Now you can go in VR to build something. You know, it's, it's pretty amazing. The very entry to you know, parts and stuff. You know, before it was like you need all these tools, you need to learn what pencils do what, but you know, uh, now you can kind of just go in and you're in 3D space um, and you can just you can create a scene and export that into other programs. Um, you know, one of the hardest things with illustration and drawing and sketching is taking a 3D depth and you know, drawing it in a 2D plane. Now you just go into VR and there. You can just walk around and, and create all new kinds of scenes in a totally new game. It's pretty amazing. Has anyone seen the new Lion King? Well, yeah, it's pretty awesome. It is actually the entire thing was made in VR. Film, film, film in VR. Yeah. 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 So the producer, or the director, whatever, he could just put on a set, a headset, and actually walk around to choose the scenes based on the angle within. I mean, that's where we're at, right? that's pretty incredible. It's like when you, when you do green screen stuff, you know, the act, you see the actors, they're in the suits, and they're, they're supposed to pretend they're in a, in a scene. Now you can visualize, see yourself in that in real time. It's pretty amazing. And as a director, you know, you have the, the camera, and you're seeing in real time what it's going to look like, rather than hope it looks right when you <laughs> render it out. Yep. And, and Mary, you mentioned Ford's actually said they've come out saying that they're only going to model cars now in VR. They're not but I heard. Yeah, it's just <laughs> one of those things where right now we're at this point where it's like we have we have VR. It's kind of this this gimmicky thing in some cases, but there's there's a handful of these uh, use cases like a Ford where there's immediate ROI. So like to create this big clay car and run it through the wind tunnel and do all these tests on it and get feedback is a super super expensive process. But now you can do it in VR, and they can probably do it in a fraction of the time, a fraction of the cost. Well, all the tests, the computer power can do it. Um, and so it's just, it's a, it's a, you know, there's all these like very niche applications out there that have just the immediate ROI and Ford and a couple other auto companies that have identified it and now are exclusively using VR to design it. And so that's where we get super excited because we can go to Steve and be like, hey, we're not crazy people over here doing the VR thing. Like, here's a real world use case. Let's get your students up to speed and ready. Now that that can's gone around, you got to describe what it. I mean, it's one thing to see it on a can, but what? Tell them the other parts of it like, that you actually can live in that world. Yeah, well, I'll offer it for anybody when we're done talking here. But it's on all four of these headsets. If you go into the app, the one you should go into Tilt Brush because it just really illustrates how powerful this tech is at a very simple level. And our first test with folks is to to, to Ty's point in terms of understanding. Depth. Uh, our first test is to have people try to draw a cube in VR, and the the success rate is I'd say probably less than fifty percent. 
Um, because you don't realize you can actually step forward and see. I was going to talk about that in terms of like digital natives versus, you know, when, when the teachers came over here to try stuff out, it's, it's you know, they they look at it as a piece of paper and they draw the phrase yeah. and then they draw the legs going up like that. And then they, and, and this, but the kids, they, they got it pretty quickly. They draw the face and then they rotate and then they draw the next one. Like they, That's right. They knew immediately that they were, not immediately, but, but pretty quickly they could, a lot of people will write their name. And I'll say, all right, now we'll walk around with them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. Pretty surreal. I think also in education too, I'm, I'm a visual learner, so I think um, it's so cool in virtual reality, we can scale you down, we can make you big, we can grow things, shrink things, like I can go into like a car engine or something, and I can get inside of it and understand how it works at my own pace and pick it up and turn things around and pull them apart. I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing how it can be uh, customized for different people to, to work. Think about that in the context of now do that with the human body or do it with a frog. Yeah, we were talking, that's right, we were talking about like eventually in biology you no longer have this stinky frog, you have to dissect and you just do it. And we are, and then the great thing about that is if a child or kids like really get excited about that experience, like we can give them a human cadaver in VR and then they can keep learning and expanding, which I think is pretty awesome that that path that you get. Um, you get the kind of bottom frog of the class, now you can do it as many times as yeah. so. <laughs> um, Let's talk a little bit about the uh, job simulator. Did, did, I, did anyone see I Land in Homeland's playing? When I first came here, I brought my husband in front of me. He spent 45 minutes in, like, it's a convenience store one, where you pretend like you're a convenience store. Sorry. I guess you're not spending it. Well, the, the premise of the game is that uh, it's the year 2050. Pause coming for you. 2050, all the robots have taken our jobs, and now they've created a museum for us to go back and remember what it was like to job. But they kind of got it wrong because they used Wikipedia articles and so the game's a little absurd and not quite right. Um, <laughs> what, why, why do you think people have such a positive reaction? Why is it one of the best VR experiences? Uh, well, we, we spent a lot of time, so this was early days of this new VR iteration. Um, two years ago. Two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> technology was really fast. Um, you know, we, we spent a lot of time just perfecting how does this work? What happens when, you know, in, in VR, it's like, okay, we make this thing one VR. In VR, there's no, you know, I, I can put my hand through it in VR, but in, in real life, I obviously can't. So it's like, what happens when you're in VR and you hit a table that's not really there? I don't know if anyone even understood that, but there's a lot of really weird cases of, of how you design for this stuff. And we spent a lot of time kind of perfecting that and coming up with really weird terms because we're laying down the tracks as this train is going 30 miles per hour. Um, so we, we really were into um, creating the most intuitive experience. And um, um, also I think its success was because we decided to um, go with this theme that was um, kind of relatable. Everyone's worked at a convenience store or an office job or whatever, but we made it funny. Um, when people are going into VR and doing these experiences, I mean, no, no matter what it is, even the whale one, the grown adults are giggling and laughing, it's, it's ridiculous, it's amazing. Um, so we really wanted to lean into that and create something fun that people like, take the headset off and they're laughing and having a great time. Um, and plus we just got to make fun of like, what yeah, <laughs> yeah. you know, Well, the kids yeah. love the office job, right? It's one of their favorite experiences. You don't know what they're getting. You see the parents' faces when they come in here to like, pick up their kids from a birthday party you have six kids that are just working in a cubicle. They just stuck up their chain. Let's talk a little bit about uh, we, 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 when we met last week, we talked a lot about um, getting people the headsets right now and experiencing it. Like, that, that's how VR is going to grow. And that's how we're going to create more content. Can we talk a little bit about that through the lens of the world? Yeah, I think I can. I think it's Speak to something that I think um, I'm here often. So the last time, before, before last year when I got the headsets here, you know, I had been in Google Cardboard or, or wherever it was five years ago and had tried it, and, you know, probably got sick. And 
you know, any, anybody, any other teacher that I can give a set of headsets to and took them on the roller coaster or whatever, they were just like, okay, yeah, that's really interesting, but no way in the world am I ever going to compare to that. This, this stuff blows that away in just a, in just a short iteration of the technology. Um, and I think it speaks volumes to where it's going and how quickly it'll get there. Um, because it is, it feels so seamless and it feels so real. Um, there's no, there's no hesitation of the, the video feed. It's, it's just, it's just really amazing. And I think even my most tech savvy teachers that tried it three or four years ago, I've, I've had to really, really encourage them to come back again because they kind of had made a decision about that technology three or four years ago and to try to get them to just give them one more shot, like convince them that that all things change. <laughs> so, about okay. here, one of the barriers is getting people into the technology. One, like we are, like we got a little uh, history table up there in the front. Yes. Uh, if you got a chance to come check it out, but, like VR has been the next big thing for the last hundred years, right? Like you go back and, and like the concept of it has been the next big thing. It's going to revolutionize everything. And our our funny joke is to a lot of these presentations uh, we start out by showing the Pin Master because that was the mm -hmm. first mass market VR device. And if you go back and look for look at advertisements from the 1950s, it's touted as something that's going to revolutionize education and travel. It's going to be the same, same stuff we're saying today, basically. Um, and uh, uh, but the, the reason it's different this time around is the computing power has finally caught up, and now the refresh rate on the headsets is, is fast enough that your mind can't tell the difference. So you are fully really immersed, um, and uh, and hopefully this is a new way. And a new way that's here to stay. Unlike the virtual boy back there that came out in 1994 that was discontinued after that couple of months. Yeah. What did I say? Virtual boy. Oh, yeah. 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 I didn't even know that existed. So I said, it's yeah. rough. Uh, <laughs> but there's also, even today though, with the high end computers, it comes down to user experience. So, as I was alluding to earlier, we're playing by a completely different set of rules now. No difference than when we went from PC to mobile. If you took PC design, Though that same playbook and rule book, and you shove that in mobile, it wasn't going to be a super, uh, super nice or elegant experience. And now we're experiencing that same rut going from PC and mobile to VR. And so the, the beauty of something like Job Simulator and Ty and his team, they spent a ton of time thinking about what are the new, what are the new rules now that we're playing by. What are, what are the fact that the simple example. Of about the table. Like, those are all things that nobody's thought about before, and so they need to come up with a solution for it one by one. Is here, think about how many interactions you have sitting in the cubicle, right? So they have solved a lot of problems. Um, and uh, for better or for worse, there's, uh, we need more people like Ty thinking that critically about it. Um, because if somebody does get into that VR experience, they write it off for two or three years, and the conversation's over, then we're having a fight to get back in. But at the end of the day, here at Rank 5, our trick is beer and pizza. Because people <laughs> understand those things. Uh, and then we trick them into a headset and they're like, oh, okay, I can't get it now. So, if you think about the, the iPhone, you know, uh, when the apps came out, I remember when the iPhone first came out, I had a, a beer app that would fill up and then I could pick and drink a beer here. <laughs> 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 it's like the dumbest thing I've ever seen. Yeah, it's like a second yeah. lighter. But we, they didn't know. I mean, they're yeah. like, it's new technology. People are trying to figure out. Yeah. So, you know, there's an accelerometer. I don't know. Um, you know, uh, but now it's like flick this and flick right and pinch and zoom and it's like stuff you don't even think about anymore. We're seeing it. VR. It's like we're figuring that stuff out right now. And it's huge to at some point now. It's gonna be like you go in there and you don't even think about any of that uh, user experience. You know what I mean? Beer and pizza work with high school students. <laughs>
with seniors, there's some interesting things being done with VR in terms of quality of life and mental health and um, dementia and being able to access parts of the brain that you can't with other, with other mediums. So one of our favorite things to do is we, get, we have families in here all the time and we got a grandma that never thought she would have tried VR and uh, one of our, our staff will kind of strategically start talking to her and then try to find out like, an important site to her, maybe like a place she grew up or a church she got married at or a, or a site she would like to go to. And then we'll go and pull it up in Google Earth. So it's just an image, right? But then then get the headset on and put them in that spot. And it can trigger this emotional reaction um, that's, that's pretty powerful. So yet it's a really simple use case of VR. I mean, there's a lot of studies done by a lot of people that are much smarter than me that are um, starting to poke and prod and, and figure out, like, okay, we're able to access parts of the brain here with VR experiences that we can't with any other medium. How do we harness that for quality of life? You're in a nursing home in Minnesota, and it's it's gray outside, and you're stuck inside for three months. Um, back to that democratizing experiences, one of our favorite things to do is we go to senior homes and uh, we'll put people courtside at NBA game or a tour of the White House. Um, just these cool experiences to kind of let them uh, escape. There's always that one person in the room though that's like, you guys are up to no good with your VR. She used to be a tour guide at the mansion up in the loop. I can't think of it as well. Thank you. And wasn't she like, maybe you weren't telling you the story, but somebody in your team was, and she was like, then narrating the whole tour for everyone. Was that the, the 93-year-old one? I, I know. The, the one story I thought was the 93-year-old woman yeah. was, uh, where we had one of our customers, Joel, uh, she she uh, went back to her hometown. The whole family was standing outside, and Joel kind of navigated her through her hometown while she was telling stories about these places. Um, it then ultimately brought her to like the Tower, which is a place she had never been before. Uh, Joel took a picture of it. The family actually went out to dinner and, and then came back after dinner to tell us that that's all she was talking about all day yeah. long. Joel posted it online. It's gone viral. Like it goes viral like once a month. I feel like it's, yeah. it's on the first page of Reddit. It's got like over a million views or something. Mm -hmm. uh, which is just one of those really simple use cases. For, for yeah, I, I don't know what the other one was. Yes, yeah, so there is uh, just a small group of uh, seniors that came in. And you know, we never know what people are going to identify with. Um, so we always think, like, oh, they're going to want to go to the Eiffel Tower or to Rome or something like that. Uh, and these three ladies, uh, one of them pulled up the Glenshee Mansion and started doing it. We can go inside the mansion. I, I didn't know what the Glenshee Mansion was. Uh, but oh my gosh, they were in there for 45 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> it was the coolest thing they have ever seen. And so, yeah, so it's just one of those pieces where, uh, you know, no matter if you're age, uh, you're going to identify with something in VR, uh, whether it's, you know, the Lynching Ranch or Beat Saber or Dobbs uh, so, but that was a really neat experience, so. And then the way, uh, yeah. yeah, so, and this is an area where, um, it, it, uh, we knew there was, there was something there, but we didn't realize how impactful VR was going to be for kids on the spectrum. Uh, VR creates a safe space for them to engage, so something like a job simulator, for instance. The kids come in, and not to generalize or stereotype, but we'll have we do a bunch of VR camps uh, with with kids that are all on the spectrum. They'll come in, they're not really engaging with each other. Um, they've been getting a hard time engaging at school that day. We toss them in the job simulator, and they're you know working at, as an auto mechanic, and they have a robot barking orders at them. And these kids go from zero to sixty in a matter of seconds. Fully engaged, they're following instructions. So, uh, so you have kind of, uh, we've had some occupational therapists in here, and they're just like fireworks are going off, and they're lighting up with all these ideas. So, for like a corporate, um, think of a large company purchasing, make, making the investment in the, the the hardware certainly, and then maybe also uh, helping fund the development of a software program, maybe specific to them. Is it largely because the cost of the hardware is pretty spendy stuff that that the typical consumer wouldn't wouldn't be buying? It's cool. I mean, hopefully, like we're doing training here, so like we'll work with architecture firms where they'll come in and we're a service provider to them, right? 
right, a turnkey or a sort of white glove solution to them. Um, because this stuff's a pain in the butt to operate still. Uh, and it's still, I don't know, hopefully everything's working today, but like, it's, it's not, it doesn't fire all cylinders every day. If you're not in the business of it, uh, you're not going to be able to, it's, it's going to become more of a distraction than it is uh, uh, a powerful tool. Um, but hopefully at some point in the future, every company has, uh, it will go from, I think of a computer, right? You'll have a computer lab at Target, but then eventually everyone will have a massive desk. Right? And you have them at home, and then it's a content game. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I have more questions than answers when it comes to what's happening. Because I, I can see this being like Netflix. If yeah. I want to go to the Eiffel Tower, I can load that or web sheet magic. Yeah. One last question, sorry, Ty. What, what's the company you said you went here real quick? Uh, Wall Ride. Wall Ride. Yeah. Yes. Previously, I was at uh, Alchemy Labs in Austin and Pixel Farm in New York. Oh, okay. So I was the director of VR there for a few years. Uh, we worked with Coca Cola and Invisalign and Cola Boy and a ton of places around town. Event <laughs> type stuff. Now yeah. I'm doing it for I really like that job. So much. Thank you. That's uh -huh. really cool. I was just going to say, like going back to applications, at least at Target and retail, you know, like Walmart has rolled out VR and they're training new cashiers. Um, so they're actually, they've bought enough headsets where they're going around the store for using VR for cashiers to get experience, kind of real life experiences before they're actually messing anything up on the register. Um, that was one of the things I was going to say, is one of the, one of the uses, so that was a perfect example um, of, of data that you can mine from the experience. Um, so I have a teacher coming in here to look at a, what's called Ovation, which is a, a simulation where they're public speaking. So, so the kids are all going to be doing their own public speaking, and the, and the program is going to record everything <coughs> and tell you how many ahs and ums you said, what, were, what, were, what were your hands doing at the time, where was your head facing. Um, the same thing is true if you, if you have a quarterback that's going to do 100 repetitions of, of passing the ball, it's going to give them feedback the end of that, and they didn't have to employ all the wide receivers to, to go up there and run around all the times. They were able to do a repetitious thing and, and get a bunch of feedback. So I think that's a, a powerful use of it. Uh, you pair that with big data in terms of you know exactly where the quarterback is looking, what decisions they made, and there's no bias in the system. It takes all the bias out. Then you know, that's where like a Walmart, for instance, they, they're the first company to roll it out at scale. And they, they have 16 or 17,000 headsets now out at stores using with middle market managers where there's just think about the inconsistency in a company like Walmart in terms of their training and the judgment in terms of who gets uh, elevated to the next level and the bias in that system. And so here you go, they have employees going through VR simulators now on, on engaging with a customer or engaging with a fellow employee and based on the decisions they're making, that's pure data that goes into the file for them is, is, is determined whether or not they can vote it. And, you know, right now we have head tracking where you have the headset on and it can really only tell where your head is. Um, you're super close to having uh, eye tracking within the headset, so now I can see where exactly you're looking. And you know, again, data we can track, you know, can you make eye contact? How long did you look at this and that? It's pretty great. Yeah, okay, we'll start over here. Hi. Super excited. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> uh, at least for a very long time. Um, I think that uh, you know it's up to the companies and, and corporations and stuff. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> well, oh, as an independent developer, you know, I I you know, I set my own rules on my content and stuff. So. I mean, there there are going to be bad actors, right? With any sort of go back in time, look at any next wave of tech. And it's like a, look at all the negative, negative negatives, but on the whole, hopefully it's, it's it's a positive. Where I get concerned is on the social aspect because there is going to be a. I mean, the reason uh, not to go off the deep end here, but the reason Facebook bought Oculus is that was almost a defensive play because if they view VR as an executing platform on the mobile, they're like, okay, we better own that platform, otherwise someone else is going to be the Facebook of VR and get kicked out of the ecosystem. So, is Facebook the best decision maker, the best usher of the social platform in America? So, no. Quest right now, it has inside out. We don't need 
lighthouses on the walls. It, it flips it around and on your head. It, it reads the room and it fits in real time. Uh, you're just going to find that, hopefully, what I would like to see is ease of, ease of use and the barrier uh, to entry for, for people to have this in their homes and easily set it up. Um, in terms of content, I think like entertainment, you're just going to find more social experiences and multiplayer is going to be, you know, we're going to have faster in there, we're going to have faster processors, uh, so we'll see a lot more of that. I, can, I guess I can only speak entertainment, not the other hand. Yeah, I mean, we're believers here at Random 5, but unlike mobile enterprise, it's going to be the primary driver. We look two years out, four years out, and then consumer versus kind of the mobile of its consumer and let its way into. But on, on the hardware piece, it's like there's so much cool RD going on right now with like fluid driven blood. Because yeah. it comes out with the haptic feedback. How do you, how do you, like, make your haptic, right? How do you, how do you replicate that? Computing power is just going to keep getting better, and the device is going to get smaller. But for us, if we look at these, and there's a lot of headlines about the hardware limiting the use cases, but for us, it's like it's content. The hardware is there. We just don't have a reason to use it yet. Right? I mean, when, when good stories were told on the TV in black and white, like you felt the motion, right? You were drawn in. It wasn't the, you know, yes, we're 4K now, but if it's a good story, you're going you're gonna to have that, that impact, right? So we just need more, we need more content. But I mean, Travis and I have been out in the valley and we've had like Ready Player One suits on that like adjust temperature up and down yeah. the whole thing. So there's, there's crazy stuff in the pipeline. Well, and there's an acquisition that Facebook just made. Uh, I'm blanking the name right now. Uh, yeah, uh, so, yeah. So, yeah. so they make a, a sensor um, that's basically sensing what your brain is telling your nerves to do, or telling your, your body to do. So what they'll do is have like a, a, a wristband on, um, and if I hold my hand shut, when I try to open my hand, it'll sense, okay, your brain is actually saying open your hand, so in VR, your hand will go like this. So, you know, for, for something like visualizing, uh, you know, walking and something like that, that can be a really powerful tool. Um, you know, what the use cases that they're thinking about, we don't know, but, you know, you start adding some of those um, sensors onto your body, The other thing we haven't talked about at all today is, is augmented reality, which oftentimes gets fucking in with the art. It's a whole new talk starting right now. Completely. Completely. <laughs> <laughs> Grab the other beer. But like eventually the, the, the device that you have on will be, it's, it's just me talking, will be a combined AR and VR device. So you can have full virtual world and then you can also do the real world. How's the town group? Um, I know you Yeah, that's the uh, gap yeah. So this yeah. had real teeth, and I'm going to take it back to the shell of my defense books. I'm a product developer, and uh, I do a photo trip in lots of stuff. So I really want to hear more about that campaign. Can you tell me how that came into life? And then as a small business, because we are a whole other operation, right? How would something like uh, prototyping in VR apply to a business that is not something that works? A lot of the key in is, is we, at Rev5, what we're trying to do is, is bridge that gap between potential users of VR and all this crazy stuff we have going on over here. And we talk this crazy language, Ready Player One, yeah, yeah. So how can we bridge that gap? And what better way than to do it than a, a cool company like Modest, local craft beer? Um, we have a, uh, Philip here actually is, is part of our uh, artist residence program. So what we like to do is we have these tools, but we need to give more artists more time in these tools to figure out what we can do with this stuff, right? So, uh, so it was one of our dreams from early on to create a beer can in VR. It's a really simple use case, but relatable, right? We're using the same tools that Ford is using to design, but people, back to the people understand the beer. So let's let's combine them too. So we one of our artists uh, creates these spacey crazy worlds, so it's a match made in heaven. And so, uh, when we're done here, we can, we can pull it up on some of these computers, but she created a can, right? A three-dimensional can that has these flowers and everything coming out of it, and this entire space world, avatar world around it. And then as simple as 
uh, we went in, it's not simple, but we basically like unpeeled the can and then took a picture of it the same way that John Favreau uh, filmed the Lion King. And then that's what they printed on the can. And you, you have a digital, you have literally put on a headset and you have a virtual camera. We took a picture and then that just kicks out a file and the different things you can print on your um, and then to answer your second question, like part of what we're doing is we're trying to make this stuff accessible to the non force of the world. So we have a lot of engineering firms that Travis does all of our architecture and engineering work, but we have firms that come in here and use this space and hardware for design uh, for the tech as a team. So we'd love to talk more about that. See. The efficiency to it, like, you know, pulling that barrier of like, I need to hold all the time, rotate the camera, and I'm trying to set up vertices. Now I can just go into it, like, walk into the scene, make a cube, I can walk around here. <laughs> well, we, had the, we have some sensory friendly events and Target was kind enough to, to donate some of their sensory friendly furniture and we had the design team over here the other day 